This presentation is by Jason Duggan from the University of Georgia, Northwest Georgia Research and Education Center in Calhoun. Jason? You bet. Well, good to be with you guys again. Um, the heifer selection topic is, is one that can have a lot of different angles. I'm definitely going to be taking a little different one. You know, I'm going to probably take the approach of more of a, a visual type approach. And so you don't really find this in textbooks as much. However, it is based on you know, decades of just stockmen. Um, and we know this across species, whether it's swine, sheep, goats, even horses to some degree. You know, females need to look like females, males need to look like males. And that improves various aspects of livestock production. And we're going to look at that from varying angles today. And then we can bounce that into some of the things that you've talked to uh, Pedro about, uh, and even the nutrition aspects and things that Dr. Jones can, can maybe pull all together here at the end and give his perspective of doing this for uh, a few decades himself, as he just mentioned. So this is the goal here, right? You guys have, have went through various modules I know already. So the goal is a female that's gonna calve every year. You know that now, you guys have been learning and looking at these uh, different aspects of beef cattle production now for for a while through these different modules and things that y'all have been uh, meeting on. The things to think about in this particular picture, though, is the body condition of this female and the status of production that she's in. So this particular female, she's nursing a calf that's approximately two months old. She's going to need to be breeding back here very soon or at the point of that uh, very soon. So she's in a body condition score of relatively a five at least. You don't see any open ribs. Uh, you see a live calf. Uh, you see that um, she's a female that, that looks like a female. And so in general, this is kind of the, uh, a general target that we're looking for, a female that does her job in your environment. So part of why she looks like this is how you manage her. And the other part is genetics. And so both those things always apply, whatever we talk about. But think about this particular female as we go through. So I'm going to show you a few pictures of bulls here and there, because I want you to be thinking about, uh, you know, animals and, and how they look, regardless if they're bull or female, male or female. So look at this particular bull as he moves and see if he's reaching and stepping off both ends like he should. So we want our females to move, you know, as they're... You know, you know, pushing and, and reaching off of either end. So this particular bull here, uh, whether you know much about visual evaluation or not, this Simangus bull for a Simangus reaches and pushes off either end pretty well. And I want you to be able to recognize that by the time we're done today, that how they move does impact their livelihood. If you think about just us, when we have aches and pains in our joints and knees and ankles, that impacts things. And now on the days, we've got more problems with feet and leg structure than we've had in my lifetime, at least. And most of the time, that's because we've accidentally bred for them. So let's keep that in the back of our minds as we go as well. So at, I usually always bring this up. Our outcome on the farm, whether it's an individual calf or how much money we make, is dictated mostly by two general principles, and that's going to be how we manage them in our environment. The other one would be the genetics. If we take one of those out of the equation, it's going to mess something up pretty big time. We have both of those things, and we have hopefully a good day. All right, so I always like to bring up this slide because in whatever we do, and the, particularly the seed stock people, really like to take it too far sometimes. All we need to do usually in the commercial cow-calf segment is to just stay in the middle of the road. We don't have to make them super big. We don't have to make them super big time at any particular trait. We're trying to get that calf every year. That's the goal. Be thinking about that as we go through here. And I would like to just add this in for a little comedy relief. Um, in, the, in the purebred business of the world, sometimes people go so far and so fast that they end up really shooting themselves in the foot. They may have the fastest growing calves that you can find. They may have the best carcass merit that you can find, but their cows don't breed. If you don't have cows breeding, it doesn't matter. So always remember that. It doesn't matter how much your neighbor's calves weigh if they don't have very many of them. So average winning weight's great, but how many pounds per acre are you winning? As I'm sure you probably already discussed to some degree. So let's get right into it. Everything you see, bull or female, we're thinking about females or not, 
Everything you see on that animal is impacted by genetics to some degree. And the other part obviously is how we manage them. But everything we see is important, even right there in the middle of their body. It is, it is important. That chest and that gut is a big factor in how your females perform and ultimately how your calves perform. So be thinking about that. We'll, we'll look at that here in just a minute. There's different terminology and things that I don't want to get tied up into this. Uh, you know, main keys that we can look into uh, as we start talking about various things. Uh, we often talk about hip structure and things like that, hooks to pins. We talk about the word hock. You know, we're mostly referring to the to this hock here in the rear leg. Uh, this right here is going to be the rib cage area. If we say something about flank, that's this area here kind of tied to that uh, the gut area. So those are some key terms that we tend to talk about. Of course, rib and loin, uh, we tend to talk about that more so from a meat science standpoint. However, even in your females, you want them to have a decent amount of muscle to them. So they need to have some rib and some loin. We usually, we usually just say need to have some muscle to them, some adequate muscle, not a whole lot, but an adequate amount of muscle. And then the structural realm, we talk about their pasterns. So this area here from that duplaw, uh, down the back side of the, to the back side of the, to the hoof, we call that the pastern area or the heel area as we get on down into the foot. That back side of the foot is the heel. You think, why is this important? Because we've got more problems than we've ever had. And our, our feet in the industry are having problems. I went out and looked at our farm with some, some cattle down at our research station. I saw, I think, a female that was probably four years old. And she's going to have to be cold because she's got an outside of your claw that's twisting up and she's not going to really be functional in a few months. Um, she's probably a little bit, she's laboring on it now, not doing well, and she's just not going to breed, breed again. Now, could she be trimmed up potentially and put a lot of time and investment? Potentially so, but that's just not very practical uh, for a, a real world production scenario. So thinking about females and how we see them, there's four basic things we can think about. All our beef females need to have muscle. They need to have volume. A volume in this particular case, though, is basically their chest and gut. All right. Um, when I, when I think about volume, I want you to think about a greyhound dog. A greyhound dog is very small middle, and you can feed them things, all the biscuits you wanted, and they're not going to gain a lot of weight. But then you think about a basset hound. It doesn't take a lot of biscuits to make a basset hound fat. So there's that volume aspect that ties into their physiology and ties into basically how they translate the nutrition you put into them. So volume is important in the beef cattle realm. If they have a very little amount of body volume, their chest and gut, to through their gut, then you've got an animal that's probably going to require more feed. And then the opposite can be true as well. You can have an animal that's too big gutted and have too much, uh, need too much feed. I usually don't see that that often. We will probably be looking at that in the future as, um, our, as an industry because of the, the cost of feed. But that's a different time, uh, different topic for a different time. Balance, we'll talk about that here in just a minute, and structural correctness we've already hit on. Those are the four basic components, along with uh, we need some growth in these animals, obviously, and we need them to have, look like what they're supposed to look like. Females need to look like females. So this particular female, obviously, she's a registered, well-groomed Angus female, but it makes for a nice picture. This particular female looks like a female, and you can tell that just by looking at her head, neck, and shoulders. Uh, she, 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 you can tell as a, someone who's been around cattle for a little bit, this is not a bull and it doesn't appear to be a steer. You obviously see that she's a female. I know that, is a, that sounds almost weird to even talk about it, but it'll make more sense here in just a minute. So when I talked about balance earlier, balance is just proportionality. So if you look at this female in th three separate third compartments, let me show you what I mean by that. If you take her and just put her in these three circles around her. If you find those three circles relatively filled in the same, relatively speaking, hopefully more of it shifting to the middle and rear one thirds, you're gonna find a female as a yearling. You can apply this to bulls as yearlings as well. Those animals tend to have what you want. And I'll, this will make more sense in the next slide. But if I fill those circles in, particularly those middle and rear one, rear one thirds, and I'm getting what I want. I can tell if they've got the muscle I want. I can tell if they've got the volume I want. And if they've got too much of the front one third, I can tell if they've probably got a problem with femininity. So 
look at this next picture here. This is what you don't want. If you think about this in the, in the bison world, this works. In the beef cattle world, this does not work. And again, this is not something you find in a textbook. We just know it to be true in livestock husbandry uh, over the decades. Now, do we always know every single answer by looking at them? No, there's a lot more to the, to the puzzle. And that's why we breed them and we evaluate them. We preg check and all those things. But generally speaking, if we're breeding heifers that look like this, we're going to have challenges. So keep that thought in mind. We want females to look like females. We want them to be proportioned out or balanced to have the right proportionality in each one of those thirds. And hopefully in these females, we don't have a lot of that front one third. We don't mind them having a little stoutness of shoulder, a little bit of mass up front, but we want them to get stouter and bigger as you go back in the animal through that rib cage, gut, hip, and hind quarter. All right, so we'll hit on muscle real quick. Most people get muscle, so we won't spend a lot of time. You know, muscle is, is round and it's not flat, generally speaking. So heavy muscle animals have more shape to them. Uh, they end up being thicker and they're, you know, the skeletal width is usually thick. You think about dairy cattle, they have a narrow skeleton um, and you don't see a lot of muscular roundness to them. So we have light muscle versus uh, heavy muscle. The light muscle animals from behind look like an upside down triangle is how the Jorgensen's muscle theory describes it. And that's generally not a problem. People see muscle. So I want to show you two pictures here. This is the interactive part. I want to show you two pictures. We went through balance. We went through muscle just really briefly. Now I want to talk about structural correctness a little bit. I want you to visualize what the skeleton should look like in these two pictures. You've got two options here. You've got option A as one option, and then option B. So if you want to put it in the chat box, you can, or you can just chime out and say, if somebody feels real confident, which one do you like better? Which one do you think is more functional, A or B? Uh, I go with B. I think A is a little too straight. Okay, very good. I would agree with that. And that is the point of this, this slide show here, this A and B. So he, as he said, they're too straight. So if you think about just us, we, we have our, our legs at our knees. We, we're not perfectly straight when we're standing up straight. Our knees still have just a little bit of bend to them. If we were to really go straight with our knees and just to get them as straight and as rigid as we could, I think people used to say and make a joke that you'd pass out if you stood there long enough. But more appropriately, if you start trying to walk, you've got to be able to bend those knees. You've got to be able to flex those joints. And so cattle, when you have them straight in their shoulder and you that straightness of shoulder carries down to straightness in their knee and straightness in their pastern, and those animals just do not walk very well. And the bulls are not going to be very aggressive in terms of their breeding ability. They're not going to be very athletic, more so. Um, they're just not going to be able to get out and function. And if those females aren't functional uh, and not built right, they could have a multitude of issues. Um, and the, their progeny, the feedlot, could have a multitude of issues and may not gain as well, may have some mobility problems. Uh, the list could go on. But B is what we're looking for. We're looking for some angle in these joints. Those animals reach up and set their track. We're going to continue to build on that. So here's a herper bull. Again, we can apply this to females as well. Same principles, exactly the same. We want these animals to have some slope of shoulder. And so what I mean by that is the shoulder here, just like this red line is here from the top of their shoulder down to what we call the point of shoulder down here, it needs to have that 45 degree angle to it. Uh, there are some cattle, which I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, I mean, the front of their shoulder it starts uh, up here where this bull's crest of his neck is. It's more so like this, and you end up with an animal that's just all the way from the top down is not moving correctly. And there are a whole lot of cattle right now that are built like that because we just tend not we tend not to pay attention to it. If they're EPDs for this or that or what we want, we'll go ahead and buy them anyway, and we're buying problems in some cases. Right. So here we'll touch on volume real quick. This is a really good educational tool right here for me. This is These are old pictures. This is an old class of cattle for a, a judging class, right? And you guys aren't going to have fancy show heifers on hoffers. I get that. This is a really good educational opportunity here to see cattle uh, for what they are. So one thing I wanted to go over with you on this particular uh, slide here is I want you to visually put a circle around the front, middle, and rear one-third of each one of these females as a cursory way to kind of get your feet wet on seeing animals. 
seeing animals for muscle volume balance and a little bit of structural correctness. Do that for just a second. Do your three circles around the front, middle, and rear one third. And then I want you to tell me which female of the four is the lightest muscle. Which one fills up the circles the poorest as you do that in your mind? One, two, three, or four? I say one. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? I hope you guys agree with that. Yeah, you do the three circles in your mind. You see that one is or the front one third is the largest. What's she missing? Well, she's missing volume back in her, uh, in her gut, uh, back in her abdomen. Uh, you also see that she's probably missing some muscle. Now, you might say that she might not be the lightest one, but she's going to be one of the two lightest muscle females. She's inverted. She's the opposite of the design she needs to be. You think about females that are nicely balanced here. If I do the three circles, two's a nicely balanced ever. She's not necessarily very stout. You can see that she doesn't have a lot of shape of muscle. But if I do the three circles there, she's at least a nicely balanced heifer uh, that's feminine. She's got some, she's got good depth. And again, when I'm talking about depth, she progressively deepens from forward to flank. All right. That's a maternal body cavity versus the bison we looked at earlier, which was the opposite, they would they would get deeper as they go forward. That's not necessarily a great one here, number two, but she's a decent heifer. Again, these are old pictures, and so they're not really up to date, but the, the education is still there for, for this particular set of four. Number four, she's kind of stretched out there. If you do the three circles on her, she's got a decent middle to her. She's got a decent uh, rear one-third to her, um, but she is stretched out. Number three is a heifer that a lot of people tie into. But I really want you to study number three. I want you to do the three circles on number three and tell me of the three circles, which one seems to be the largest? Or let's ask it this way. Which one seems to be the smallest of the, the three circles? If you do the three circles on half or number three, which circle seems to be filled the least? The front, middle, or rear one third? Uh, rear. The rear. Yeah. So what does that tell me? That tells me she's probably light muscles for the rest of the stoutness of the heifer. She's kind of stout and thick up front. Then as you go back, she loses it. She's one of those that's a little bit deceptive and fools people. You think she's nice and stout because you see all that stoutness up front. But then let me ask you this question. Which one looks the least like a female of two, three, and four at least? Three looks the least like a female. Is that a problem? Let's say if I'm if I'm a livestock gambling man, not in a real world gambling situation, but if I'm a livestock gambler and I'm going to cull one of these females for not breeding, it's going to be three. Now, however, I can take them all the way through breeding. All right, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But one of those that just looks like she's just not looking like a female gives me a, a lower confidence level. Is the way to put it. She gives me a lower confidence level on femininity, which tends to lead to fertility. Uh, again, uh, we're going to go ahead and breed that heifer. She's not necessarily a bad heifer, but we're just learning how to look at the differences. And if we can breed cattle to look more like four of this scenario that we've got here, we're going to do a little better than cattle that look like three that are bigger and chunkier from it. Yeah. We can go back to that if we need to. So again, if I'm looking at these females, again, these are kind of old school, old pictures here. I'm going to like these heifers more toward a four, two, three, one order. Definitely don't like one. That's the main key about this slide. Do not fall in love with animals like one that are deep fronted and deep chested, kind of have a, uh, a just kind of a semi masculine head on them. Those little things like that do matter over time. And three's not a bad heifer. She's just a little bit too broad and open shouldered, considering she doesn't have as much in her rear one third in her hip and forward. So I got another question. Now, Handy, you're not going to answer this. I'm going to push it on to some other people this time. You've got two pictures here. You only see the front end of the animal. I want you guys to tell me which one of these two is the steer. So you got to hold your piece for a minute, Handy. The one on the right. All right. You are correct. And I hope you guys agree with that. I ask this question pretty much anytime I give this real often. And you are right, except the part where they're both heifers. But you're correct. You did exactly like I wanted you to do. 
a female needs to look like a female, and you just picked out the one that really doesn't look like a female, even though she is uh, a heifer. Anyway, this heifer on the left, again, we're looking at show animals on a halter, and that's not applicable to what you guys are doing on your farms. But they're on halter, and we can see them very easily. This heifer on the left, she's got she's long neck. She has a mostly feminine head, or all her joints, rather, including her knees and hocks. They've got some flex to them. Everything looks like it's rolling well. She progressively deepens from full rib to flank, and I'm not very good at drawing. This particular female is a really nice female uh, on the left. Now, the, the female on the right that uh, the gentleman over here said she looked, she's the one who like a steer to him. Just, just look at that female for a minute. She is a big, heavy, uh, black-hided heifer that most people are going to say, okay, she's big and fat and sassy, but she is she has a lot of problems. What are some of her problems? I want you to see how she's trying to stand up on her toes there. All right? She's standing up on her toes because the point of her shoulders right here, or the top of her shoulders there, and the point of her shoulders about right here. All this stuff is way too vertical and way too straight, just like in that letter A diagram we saw earlier that, that Handy picked out, A versus B. She's a lot like that. Uh, she's also got some problems back here in her hawk and her and back here in her pasture. She's very straight back in uh, her pasture, at least, and has an awkward set to her hawk right here. Uh, she's a female that she sure is deep all the way across. She's got a lot of depth to her, but she tends to get deeper as you go forward. So just a female, just because they're big, stout females, doesn't make them good for them now. So we want them to look like heifers and have some balance and proportionality to them. Here's a close up uh, of the, the better heifer. And, you know, she's obviously not a real world type female, but we can learn from this heifer that she has some angle to her joints, uh, even up front here, angle to the, to the, uh, from the, through the pasture and through the foot. Good angle there. Her, her shoulder angle is pretty good. Um, her hooks depends is it's not too level but just level enough we don't want them jet level we can have some problems with that but as a whole right here to full rib to flank she gets just a little bit deeper as you go back and has a nice maternal look to her and this one we've already talked about her some but again she gets bigger as you go forward and structurally she's standing up on her toes you think about her as a seed stock female breeding and raising bulls out of her that are just not going to be very functional, or she had commercial calves or going to a feedlot, just not very athletic animals. And over time, uh, there's going to be some problems that, that grow out of that. Body volume again, uh, tail head set. Uh, the tail head set on that female on the right, it's a little bit rocked forward. And this is a little extra information here. Uh, when they have some, when we have a staggy set or a staggish maleish set almost to that tail head that's rocked forward they can start defecating in their vulva they can start having some reproductive tract infections and things of that nature when they have a more appropriate set to their tail head things will work better again that's a small detail that generally is not a huge problem until you start doing a lot of et work and things of that nature uh, that's influenced by all those uh, exogenous hormones but again angles and joints here female on the left has better angles than the hair from the right Here's a Herford heifer. If I do the three circles on this Herford heifer, whether I like Herfords or not, I can say that she's a fairly balanced heifer. You may not like her a lot. She may not be your type of cattle, but she is a balanced female that looks like a female. And when I look at her and say she's balanced, I'm saying that she's got enough muscle to her and enough body volume. All by doing the three circles, I can tell if she's got an adequate amount of muscle, an adequate amount of body volume. Might I find another heifer that's feminine and has more muscle than her, I might. But in general, just learning how to seed cattle, this particular heifer has got a lot of the good pieces, just a nice, solid, average heifer, feminine fronted, good bodied, appropriate or adequate amount of muscle, and her knees and joints are all kind of set well. You can see how everything flows very well and she's got angle where she needs to have it. Now, let's get into this one right here. I want you to do the three circles on this one and tell me which one of the three circles filled in is the smallest. Rear. You Go ahead, sir. Say that again. I said the rear. Okay, so what's that tell us? 
muscling. <laughs> she doesn't have she doesn't have as much she doesn't have enough muscle to it. She doesn't have enough stoutness. Okay. So I did a, the you said it was a lean of muscle, her. didn't you? Yeah, she, she's light muscle. She does not have a lot of muscle to her. So here's an, uh, a picture of a female that's uh, somebody has clipped up. She's fed well. She's on this pretty grass. And really what you have here is a, oh, an overconditioned heifer. You have a fat heifer with a, with a, that's deep in her brisket. She's deep in her forerib. Uh, but if I sit here and take this heifer and break her down, you know, this right here is just fat, extra fat. Her forerib is filled in but she's deeper in her forerib than she is back here in her flank. I want them instead to deepen from forward to flank in general, okay? I want to have a maternal body type. Instead, the smallest part on this heifer is this hip and quarter area right back here. Forgive my terrible drawing. But her fronting is bigger than her rear one third. That does not bode well for her. She's just fat. She is really just an overconditioned heifer. So you guys are thinking about heifer selection. You're thinking about the things we talked about throughout your series. You know, we need these animals to, to work and function reproductively. And a part of that is you're raising females that look like females. If you breed for carcass-oriented, high-growth animals and you start keeping those heifers year after year, you're going to end up with a bunch of high-growth, carcass oriented females that have lost their fertility. So how do we balance that out? There are multiple ways. There's breeding strategies. Generally speaking though, you're, you're going to want to balance that out. You may want to find a bull or an AI sire um, that's going to give you a balance of traits. That's the way you need to tend to do it. Or you AI for females and have a terminal cleanup bull. There can be a lot of different ways to go about it. There's really the full game. But again, we're wanting to, we're wanting uh, that that ovary, that green part right there. We want that that object, that organ, that main female organ to generate an egg and conceive when we need her to. And she's going to be doing that after that first year calf, but she's going to be doing that with a calf nursing inside. So I need her to hold her body flesh and lactate at the same time and rebreed. So how do we get a heifer to do that? Well, we provide the nutrition part through our management, but we also select and keep females that work in our environment, that have the body volume, that have the chest and gut and aren't too big for our environment to make sure they maintain that body flesh on time every year. Well, that's a picture of a dairy cow, but it's a good visual for the, we're trying to get those female organs to work appropriately. Well, I want you guys to watch this particular bull here. Well, he's, gonna, he's gonna walk a little bit more here. I want you to see if he reaches and steps off either end. On his front, he barely reaches because he's straight shouldered. And you can see that he, the, the point of his shoulder, the top of his shoulder right here is not as angled as it should be. You also see that this bull here rounds out his hip quite a bit, and he has extra set to his hocks. This particular bull here does not reach very well out of his front end, but he doesn't push out of his rear either. This is a really messed up bull structurally. Let's rerun him real quick. See how he doesn't push off his rear legs? He reaches up under himself, but he really doesn't push with those rear legs. Does that matter? Absolutely. If you're thinking about buying a bull, yeah, he needs to be able to have athletic hocks. He needs to have athletic legs to be able to mount cows. Those daughters need to have those same strength and abilities as well to get mobile around the pasture to do what they need to do to graze and calve and all those things to get up and down. This is a pretty bad ombre structurally. We'll look at that one bull we talked about earlier again. And here he is. All right, so this is the same Angus bull from probably six years ago now. And, and you know, we're thinking about females and heifer selection, but when you go buy a bull and you're keeping females, what you see in that bull is going to happen in your females, and you know this already, obviously, but every little detail. Some of them we have to buy even though we don't want to because they're not going to be perfect. There's no such thing as, no such thing as a perfect animal. This particular bull reaches up 
and where that front foot leaves, his rear foot gets fairly close. Now he could be a little bit longer striding, but he's pretty decent. Let's let's see him one more time. There we go. So as his front, he's reaching out of his front feet, reaching with his front feet, he's pushing with his front feet. He's reaching with his rear legs. He's pushing with his rear legs. Uh, he's not the best in the world by any stretch, but he's solid. Um, I, I would be, this is acceptable. The main thing is that they're just not super straight. And there's other problems too. We're not hitting every single angle here. There can be a multitude of issues. You know, there's a few slides here that we'll glaze over real quickly, but you know, we got animals with horns in their feet. Uh, here's an animal that has screw claw. And, you know, why does he have screw claw? Well, his whole foot design is bad. You see how, well, he's standing on this piece of wood here, right? But I want you to see his hairline is almost even with the back of its heel. This animal has no heel to its foot. And so he has constant infection in his, in his feet. And with that, his toes are... Are not growing appropriately. This is a very much a major cull animal. Uh, this was somebody wanted this to be a breeding bull, and I'm sure had really good genetics for certain things and certain bloodlines. But the first four inches of this animal totally throws it out for ever doing anything as a breeding animal. This is a it's extremely bad footed animal, and you can see it over here too. You can see how this foot on the far side over here is swollen and not doing very well, and it has to do because of these small claws that he has. Uh, for the, the, he probably weighs 1,250 pounds and has these really small claws that are starting to grow awkwardly because the, the weight and balances aren't correct and the infection is starting. And he's just a chronic uh, screw claw bull, the chronic, uh, and, you know, infection. I'm going to ask you a question here. Uh, based on what you've learned so far, this is a trick question. This is a Jason Duggan vague question with hardly any answers and uh, not many friends afterward. What is the best cow in your mind? A, the cow that wins the biggest calf, the cow that wins the calf every 365 days, the calf, the cow that does both A and B, the one that is impressive to look at, E, the cow that returns the most profit. The cow that returns the most profit. There you go. <laughs> and part of the equation there is having a calf every 365 days, generally speaking, right? And generally, the cow that brings us the most profit is probably going to have one of the bigger calves. But what if the biggest calf is out of your heaviest cow and she takes about 40% more feed than the other ones do? Did she make you the most money? And no. she only, yeah, I mean, I'm being very general here. But you can have some 1,700 pound cows that wean you the heaviest calf, but it costs you an extra 50 bucks to get it. Uh, and it only outweigh the, some of the other ones by maybe 25 pounds. Uh, so, and you think about feeding her for a whole year. So, the cow that returns me the most profit is the one I want. Uh, and that isn't always the one that wins the biggest calf. And unfortunately, most of the time, our biggest, heaviest cows do the poorest job. Now, that's not always the case, but sometimes it is, depending on the herd. Uh, here at the station where I work, I did a little rundown, and our seven heaviest cows, uh, six of those seven heaviest cows did the, almost the poorest job of all the animals in the herd, and they weaned an average percentage of body weight. Uh, I think it was like 32 to 35% of their body weight, and then the rest of the herd is getting closer to that 45% of their body weight. Um, those biggest seven cows, they weighed somewhere in the neighborhood of 17 and a half. Uh, and at certain times and certain years, they weighed more than that. So just a random question to be thinking about. There's our cow one more time, and I wouldn't be doing our repro folks any favors at all if I didn't ask you this question that you've heard 10 times. What's the most valuable trait in your herd times four? It's going to be fertility. Reproductive ability. That's right. Yeah, reproduction, fertility. So it doesn't matter how much genetics you have in your herd for growth or for carcass merit, they have to be born first. And then we can build on those other building blocks as we go along. Here's a female I want to show you. I went to a farm and they wanted to uh, start selling freezer, freezer beef. They've got a female here that um, probably is not necessarily a bad cow, but what's wrong with her? She's super thin. She's lost her ribbon loin. Her muscle in her top line is gone uh, because she's had to utilize that muscle in her top to 
uh, live. She's had to mobilize that the nutrients from her muscle to survive. Hey, Jason, um, this cow has been on hay that's super, super low quality. And, you know, they got a situation here that she may have the genetics to have a calf every year, but the nutrition wasn't there. She had been eating something worse than straw uh, for a long period of time. She was probably in a body condition score of a, of, of a two at least. And she's probably actually gaining weight right now, but it's going to take a long time for that muscle to come back in her top line. She had, she had been very, very thin, ultra thin. And, and that's a welfare issue is what that is. Um, she, you see this, um, this muscle right here that she had in her back. Right. Completely gone. Hmm. It is really about this. It's about this big right in here. She lost that much muscle just to survive. So the genetics were there. So this is the management of the other component. So that, that's just the, the, the point there. This cow's a little older, and you're right. She needs some dewormer. You can see that bottle jaw in her, in her, underneath mm -hmm. her chin. She's, she's in, in a bad shape in a bad way in a lot of ways. But she's older, too, so she's kind of getting the double whammy. She's getting thin because she's old. She's thin because she doesn't have anything to eat. The thing about it is, there's hay everywhere, but it's just very low quality. Now, I want you to watch her here. She can't even, you know, she can hardly walk to the pasture because uh, she's so weak. So, notice that there's hay everywhere here. And part of our heifer selection, part of our heifer development is animals that fit our environment and us managing our environment. We got to be able to develop these heifers, regardless of how good they look, regardless of their genetics. We've got to give them the, the nutrition that they need. We won't get into this stuff. I've taken enough of your time. But we could talk about foot scoring and various things. Uh, we could go on and on, and, and there's lots to talk about, but it's, I'm already lost some of my time here. Um, I'm just going to roll on through it. We can do this another time in the future uh, if you want to. And it's been a pleasure, and uh, open it up for any questions you may have. Thank you, Jason. Any questions? I have one. Sure. When when measuring a bull for registration purposes, what's um what's the best way to go about doing? It? Okay, are you talking about hip height? I'm sorry. Yeah, hip height. Okay, I'm not familiar with you having to have a hip height for registration, mm -hmm. um, but you can simply measure from that. And I, if I can find a picture, I would show it to you. But you could simply just measure with a tape measure, depending on you know you don't want to get hurt or. You know, you can do it in a shoot or scale box or something along those lines. Um, you just basically find a way to measure uh, off the top of their hip down to the ground in inches. Um, and you apply that with how old they are and they can get you a frame score. There's multiple ways to do that. Um, you could have a, a tape measure on a board um, and then you can measure it to the ground and get that particular measurement and then take a measurement when you get the calf in the scale box of the, of the chute and take that measurement to the top between the hook bones right there um, before you get to the tail head and you could subtract basically the measurement you get um, the second measurement from the overall measurement there's lots of ways to do that but basically you're getting inches from from the, the hip from the hip all the way down to the ground I don't okay. think you have to have that, but not, not, not many people do that measurement. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. But you guys, it's a pleasure always. And um, I know many of you and uh, always a pleasure to be with you. Well, thank you. I have three kids that are working with me, teenagers, helping, and this was very educational. Okay. Good to hear that. Thank you, man, for the comment. Well, I think everybody probably after this presentation, now they know why I asked Jason to, to give this talk because, you know, it's, it's important that we add the phenotypic, the physical, the physical appearance and those kind of traits to all of the EPDs and the genetics and, and all that, because we have to be able to pick out uh, replacement animals that are going to stay in our herd, ones that are going to be able to just walk. Uh, because they're supposed to go out there and travel to pasture and eat the grass and feed themselves, at least during times of year that we have grass. And to do that, they have to have the means to travel. And then and then picking out those traits in those females that are going to make a good trait. There was uh, years ago, and I don't I don't hear about it much anymore. There was a, a an animal scientist by the name of Dr. Bonsma 
and he looked at some some phenotypic traits and the very things that Jason pointed out. Uh, the you know the front end of a female is kind of a backwards triangle. The the top line and the 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 ribs kind of start tapering toward the front of the animal, and so those are those are. Uh, and then when you look at a bull, they kind of do the opposite. You see a lot of depth in the chest, although, you know, we want to make sure that we have capacity in those cows because capacity, they need to have the capacity to go eat grass and then convert that grass into either milk or growth. So uh, all of this is, is absolutely critical. With our experience with the heifer program, we see some of these heifers that are not very feminine that just don't get pregnant. And uh, they, their reproductive tract scores are very poor. They, they uh, either don't come into heat or they reach puberty at a later, a later age. Um, and so some of these animals, if we can use those traits, provided that our animals are, are properly fed, um, is what Dr., Dr. Stewart a couple of programs ago provided the, that our heifers are properly fed, we can use their phenotype, their overall body shape confirmation to to pick out some good to, to pick out some animals that should stay in the herd for a long time and use that information with genetic traits and some of the things that Dr. Noble has talked about uh, using that combination we we ought to pick out heifers that are going to stay with us for the long haul so thank you Jason you did an amazing job I appreciate it as always and um just just excellent information that I don't think that we've had presented before. You bet. And sometimes EPDs, um, there are some EPDs we just don't utilize a lot, and, and some breeds have them, and some, some breeds don't. Um, and, and, and EPDs are, are one of those things, um, it's kind of hard to explain it without sounding bad, but utilize them as a tool. And sometimes there's some EPDs out there that can tell you about fertility and longevity. There are EPDs that are called stayability to tell you how long an animal is likely to stay in the herd uh, reproductively uh, for you know six years or longer. Um, you know, in the Hereford breed, they have sustained cow herd fertility EPD. Um, you know, in the Angus breed, they have um, you know a longevity marker, a stayability EPD. They have uh, other uh, index values, uh, and there are some value. There is some value in those EPDs, um, you know, and you can also find EPDs to help you manage your cow size. You know, if you're trying to not, if you've got your cows big enough, you don't want to get them any bigger, and you're trying to work on managing your, your ultimate mature size, there are mature cow size weight EPDs, uh, mature cow hip height EPDs, and and there's a lots that we can, that can be talked about. But I'll just suffice it to say, you can utilize EPDs along with what you're doing. And find some good solid middle of the road that still have all the other aspects of growth and carcass merit to the relative degree maybe not just crashing the scales but bring everything together but good point 